that uh, workable? Other thing that I want to ask yes. you about uh, the, about the 1973 uh, war. Uh, there is any uh, file related to that? Any uh, new disclosure about that particular war that we can find? You can search uh, by name, by uh, any text string uh, that you like, uh, and by a great many other parameters. For example, uh, all uh, cables that were sent to the CIA. You can the drop down menu will show you. Bang. Um, similarly, uh, a great many other parameters, which Bureau in the State Department was responsible uh, for handling it, uh, uh, categories by concept, uh, categories by particular regions, uh, particular organizations, etc. Et uh, it's really quite easy to use and very effective. Uh, our partners, for example, some of, uh, for example, the Hindu, uh, have only had access to this material for five days uh, and have already um, been uh, shaking uh, Indian politics uh, this morning with their revelations about Rajiv Gandhi and the uh, apparently corrupt uh, Swedish fighter jet deal. Uh, for 1973, yes, there's uh, a lot of material uh, about the uh, Syrian, Israeli, uh, Egyptian uh, war uh, during this period. Uh, hourly reporting in some cases. Uh, some of it, some of the, some of it is new in the sense that. It hasn't been reported before. Uh, other aspects have been reported before. Other aspects uh, have only been written up in rather obscure uh, academic journals uh, and have not been previously accessible really to, uh, to journalists in the Middle East. Next uh, question. Um, Good morning. Uh, Andrew Blake with RT. Um, I had uh, a question about the documents. Uh, of the 1.7 million documents, like 55,000 pages of them, were secretly reclassified during the George W. Bush administration. Is it my understanding those 55,000 pages are should not be in the public domain, according to the State Department? Then, are those 55,000 pages should be left under lock and key? In particular, those ones, as opposed to the rest of them, the, uh, nearly two million. The 55,000 pages were taken from. Some were taken from this series of documents, but not from these particular documents. Uh, they were taken from other documents in the same building or the same series. Uh, that's what we know as of 2006. Now, that reclassification program uh, was secret when it was exposed, it was widely condemned, uh, and statements were put out saying that it ended, would end in 2007. However, minutes of the State Department from 2009 which is the most recent, recent reference uh, we have been able to find, showed that that secret uh, reclassification program uh, was ongoing. Uh, now, until we do um, another, uh, we get another copy uh, of all this material, uh, say in a couple of years, uh, we can't do a, a comparison uh, to see which uh, material, if, if any material has been secretly uh, removed from this over time, but uh, of course the the, the facts and the precedences are extremely bad for uh, material uh, being held uh, by the National Archives. What I think I was going to get at, just knowing about the, the status of those documents, so if, if we can assume that at least since 2009 those documents are still classified secretly, um, did the organization weigh the release of this project any different than other ones, given that since 2010 the grand jury investigation is ongoing, Bradley Manning's been locked up without trial for over a thousand days. Jeremy Hammond's been locked up for over one year. Did the organization take this into consideration when they were weighing this project, knowing that if these files should be remain secret and the source is compromised, they'll surely be prosecuted to the same extent? Well, this material is quite co quite complex in terms of its origin. Is it the um, U.S. The, the overarching project with two million documents? Uh, has material from a number of sources. The Kissinger cables, uh, in particular, which is the, the largest body of material, uh, this is being collected uh, from 1.7 million individual uh, PDFs that we reverse engineered. That's essentially what uh, Aaron Schwartz was doing, taking documents which technically uh, should be public, but are placed in a form or, or kept in 
some intermediary uh, position between secrecy and complexity that makes them, in practice, uh, not easy enough to use uh, that people who need to understand them can understand them. Uh, so uh, if, the, uh, uh, if the Department of Justice was to go after us uh, for this release, like they're attempting to prosecute us uh, for um, uh, previous, um, previous releases involving uh, U.S. Embassy uh, documents. Uh, the approach would probably uh, be along the lines of the approach that was taken uh, with Schwartz, which it is the, sort of the, the manner of acquisition uh, as opposed to the, uh, uh, as opposed to the uh, classification of the material. Yeah, Joe Krauss from AFP. Um, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this. These 1.7 million documents, um, I mean, you're, you're not actually leaking anything new to them. I mean, these were technically available in the public domain. You're just kind of collecting them and putting them in a more searchable database. Um, and then I was also wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what, what exactly made it difficult to access these documents. If they weren't, I mean, if they were technically declassified, what, what sort of complexity um, are you talking about? Thanks. There's a, a, a range of material in the, two, in the two million documents, but if, if we just look at the Kissinger cables, which is the, the biggest component of that uh, to be released today, uh, they are technically uh, in the public domain, but as you can see with all the news stories that have come out today, uh, they're not practically um, available uh, to the public in a way that's efficient enough uh, for people to be able to make sense of them or use them. Uh, they're in the form of um, 1.7 uh, million uh, PDF files, uh, so they're, they're not uh, essentially not usable um, to uh, do sophisticated uh, searches uh, across across the uh, across the lot. Yes, that's good. Carolyn Pursuti with um, Voice of America. So to dovetail on Joe's question, there, then is your organization evolving from one that? Uh, you know, when WikiLeaks first came out, it was the leaking of classified information. Now it's evolving to more of a clearinghouse for journalists, or an organizational clearinghouse. Well, it, is, it is a continuation of the work that we've always done. In fact, we have always um, uh, merged together um, leaked information and other information uh, to increase the value of both, of both types. Uh, a lot of our work actually involves... Um, um, Making things searchable, presentable, usable. Um, you know that there's there's a trick that's uh, used by many uh, departments in, in the United States to effectively subvert the intent uh, of FOIA legislation, which is to hand out um, FOIA documents uh, in uh, scanned PDFs with all the co all the colours removed, um, not searchable, etc., uh, to to marginalise the uh, efficiency. Uh, of journalists and others, but but still technically uh, stay within the law. The gentleman said, "Yes, good morning. My name is Meredith Buell, also with Voice of America. Reportedly, you've decided to run for public office in Australia. Could you tell us if that, in fact, is true? What office you're running for, and why you decided to do this?" Well, that it's off to, off topic, but you can read um, about that uh, in the Australian press. I particularly recommend. Uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, which is the most reputable of the Australian newspapers. I did, in fact, read that article, but uh, I'm just curious as to why you decided to run for public office and, and, and what what do you hope will come out of this? Uh, I will defer that question. Okay. Okay, can we uh, take the microphone here? Can you pass it? Um, hi, I'm Rosie Gray with BuzzFeed. Um, this is also about you, Mr. Assange, but um, you've been at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London for something like eight or nine months now, I think. Um, do you, can you give us a sense of, of how long you think you'll still be there, what your next steps might be, okay. that kind of thing? Kristen, perhaps you could answer this you know, in relation to giving a bit of a status update about what's happening with the U.S. prosecution. 
Yes, I mean, uh, it's a bit off topic, but uh, we know, of course, that there is an ongoing uh, uh, investigation into, uh, into the alleged illegality of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Wikileaks action. Uh, it has been revealed by uh, information acquired under the Freedom of Information Act in Australia that uh, uh, Australian diplomats have been told by their um, State Department officials and officials here in Washington that the scale and scope of the Wikileaks investigation is, is unprecedented. Uh, a year ago, it was known that uh, the, uh, the pages of documents uh, gathered in that investigation numbered, uh, uh, was it 42,135? So it, uh, it uh, gives you an idea of, of what kind of uh, persecution is going on and is still ongoing. Uh, and it's, of course, it's, it's very worrying. It, uh, uh, a lot of people have been, uh, that have been supporting us, working with us, have been harassed at the borders here in the U.S. Uh, they've been uh, under surveillance. Uh, we have confirmation of that. And uh, uh, their information, Twitter accounts, uh, uh, etc., have been subpoenaed. So that is, uh, of course, of, of, of a great, great worry. Uh, yes, we have uh, we have Fred Julian by by Skype uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, the Embassy in London. Uh, let's hope that uh, we'll have see some uh, progress in the case there, and he will walk free and, and stand here in this podium in the, in the next press conference we we'll have here. But uh, any more questions on the topic? Yes, Jacques Rajat here with Radio TV, Lebanon. I understand the scope of these documents, of the timeline that is, and uh, you mentioned the role of uh, the Australian Foreign Minister at the time. I wonder if you can illuminate or do the documents illuminate anything about Agent X and his fate? You were saying Agent X. So do you mean Prisoner X in... Uh, we haven't searched yet. Um, given the uh, time periods, uh, these these documents go up. The, 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 the large collection uh, plus D uh, goes up to about March 2000, uh, 2010. So I suspect not, but we haven't searched yet. Can I just point out, of course, that the, the, the database is now uh, easily searchable and uh, you can basically go online onto that and, uh, and, and uh, try various keywords. So, next question. Oh. Hi, Rachel Kerzius with RT America. I was wondering if you could kind of compare the experience of looking at classified documents from the 70s and then looking at kind of new classification systems that have emerged in uh, the 90s and 2000s and say kind of qualitatively what the difference between them is? Yes, it's, it's extremely interesting. Uh, we're, we've put together here, in fact, ways of understanding the internal uh, State Department language. Um, and it, it really is a language of, uh, of tags and handling restrictions and so on. Uh, and all these are a vast uh, panoply of acronyms are automatically expanded uh, when you use Wikileaks plus the uh, search interface. Uh, the period of uh, the 1970s, in diplomacy, is referred to as the Big Bang. Uh, this is when uh, the modern international order uh, came to be. There's really only two periods, which was uh, post-World War II and what happened in the 1970s. 1970s, you had a period of decolonialization, where the number of countries a drop from about a hundred, uh, increase from about 104 uh, to 160. So that's as a result of decolonialization, uh, the weakening uh, of the British British Empire, independence movements, etc. That new situation with having more relatively independent uh, states, not part of an empire which controlled the foreign policy, meant that. Uh, Diplomacy became an essential ingredient uh, to uh, U.S. power uh, across the world. And systems were set up uh, like the GATT, for example, world, world, world organization, world trade bodies. And to understand all that complexity, uh, the U.S. State Department put together a system to harvest uh, intelligence from its diplomats across the world, 
uh, categorize them into particular tags, uh, put a variety of handling restrictions, uh, for example, notice, no distribution, which means that they just go bang uh, to one person. It's so sensitive you only want one person reading it, no one else is to read it, uh, to a State Department wide or to it also goes off uh, to the CIA, also together with handling classifications. Now, back in the 1970s, U.S. embassies were more important. Now, because of uh, the speed of international flights, uh, video conferences like we're having right now, email, etc., means that the, the center, Washington, uh, has more direct control of the periphery. But back in the 1970s, uh, the relationship between ambassadors uh, and their host governments uh, was more essential. And the mediating role that they played was more essential. So you see, for the same level of classification, a relatively higher uh, degree of important uh, political content. Also, because uh, typing systems and uh, encryption systems were more complex and harder to use uh, back then, you had uh, ambassadors not wanting uh, to use uh, top secret cables so much, which requires sending, uh, in most cases, a pouch with a diplomatic courier uh, back uh, to Washington but instead um, pushing material down into the, uh, into the lower classifications uh, for the sake of convenience. Shall we take a couple, maybe we a couple of more questions? Uh, there's one in the back. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Alice Holstein, Free Speech Radio News. Um, do you think the prosecution of Bradley Manning and other whistleblowers has had a chilling effect on new leaks of current government actions, and that's why the most recent publications have been more historical in nature? Julian? No, uh, not to the degree where uh, people have stopped doing such things, but we, uh, for us, but we have heard about, uh, in, a, in a quite important investigation recently done by a combined team involving the BBC and The Guardian, uh, on uh, General James, Colonel James Steele, uh, who was involved in the uh, El Salvadorization uh, of Iraq. Uh, that is, taking the technique for uh, paramilitaries that was used in El Salvador, CIDFs they're called, um, and putting them into Iraq, uh, something that really kicked off uh, the Sunni Shia uh, uh, religious ethnic uh, civil war uh, and James Steele was reported by Vivian Singh Guardian uh, was involved in setting up uh, or um, maintaining or running um, Iraqi uh, interrogation centers which involved torture. So as part of that investigation uh, they tried to speak to a number of uh, former, former or current U.S. military personnel, um, and they say in their uh, in their article that uh, the personnel did not want to speak and used uh, the example of Bradley Manning uh, as why they didn't want to uh, communicate with the press. Yes, we have one more question here from the front. Thank you for the opportunity again. This is Moniz Sleiman. Uh, you mentioned 1975 in Egypt, something uh, related to the Muslim Brotherhood in universities. Yes. Uh, can you clarify more? Is that a connected activity with uh, U.S. diplomats or U.S. embassy, or this is coordinated with the Egyptian government and uh, taking into consideration the Muslim Brotherhood ascending to powers now uh, many Arab countries after this called Arab Springs. There is any more information about uh, the old relation or long relationship between the United States and the Muslim Brotherhood in the documents? I encourage you to read the story uh, in El Masri Al Yum. It's uh, come out uh, come out this morning, which goes into further detail. I don't have other details 
uh, other than the ones that I just gave you. If you go to twitter.com slash Wikileaks, um, you can see tweeting a number of these headlines, uh, including uh, the one from El Masri. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes we also uh, will put out uh, a translation of that story. Um, speaking in general terms, uh, it's my experience uh, after studying many thousands of uh, U.S. diplomatic cables that the United States makes a priority uh, gaining influence uh, and contacts and informants uh, within uh, opposition movements, partly in order to uh, corrupt them, uh, partly uh, in order to uh, have bets on both uh, both the, the lead horse and the second uh, in case there's a, a transition of power. And that's clearly the case, for example, in the Australian Labour Party, that the State Department was particularly interested in developing contacts uh, with Australian Labour Party members, union members, um, and not so interested uh, in the Conservative Party, uh, who they viewed to already essentially be on side. It's perhaps a matter of, of uh, keep your friends close and keep your enemies even closer. Any last question? Uh, Julian Bibbs's um, relation to uh, the FBI investigation uh, concerns Iceland. Okay, I will do that, uh, but uh, you are signing off then from uh, London. Yes, that's okay, it for thank me. You. Thank you, Julian. Uh, yes, you mentioned uh, that uh, there were uh, just recently uh, about uh, the, uh, 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 the